India is an emerging superpower. It has got an adversary on the western side and a hostile neighbor with lingering border dispute on northern side. India needs capabilities to fight two front wars. The two front war again is a very uh, likely scenario. We can't just say that either we would fight China or Pakistan. Uh, we need to look at um, the a two front uh, scenario. Our Indian Air Force is operating with 34 squadrons while the approved strength is 42 squadrons. Now in next 10 years, another 12, 12 squadrons of MiG-21 will be retired. In addition to this, Su-27 uh, MiG will also be retiring. That means we are talking of replacement of something like 16 squadrons. 16 squadrons means about 320 aircrafts. Worrisome part is that today the deterrent value of Indian combat power is reducing. It is reducing by the day. Uh, against both in many ways. But China most of all. India has already signed contract for 36 Rafale fighter jets with France. Originally, RFP for MMRCA that was scrapped later was for 126 aircrafts. So India is still left to buy 90 4 plus generation fighter jets. MMRCA deal finally went in the favour of um, Rafale. Uh, but even there, we cancelled the deal at the end of it. We decided to buy 36 off the shelf in a sense Rafale. But at that time also, because when you look at the uh, each of those planes that were in competition, they were all more or less of the same generation. There was not a significant difference in terms of which was going to be more superior in terms of its what it could do. Uh, and I don't believe that one plane was so superior that it could undertake those 300 odd parameters under which they were tested. Uh, in any case, I think the French made a big case uh, about the technology transfer. And there were also other political considerations that went in finally in favor of the uh, French Rafale. But of course, there have been a lot of since then pricing issues and a lot of other things that have come in the way and therefore we have cancelled it and we are now going for single engine uh, fighter aircraft at this stage. The decision to reduce the number of aircraft of the Rafale category from 126 to 36, that was largely a mix of both in the re request for proposals, both categories were. It was the lightweight, the heavy, medium weight, it was the single engine and the twin engine. And the selection was made on the basis of life cycle cost and Rafale was selected. Now there is a rethink. The rethink is primarily on the count that Rafale's costs have now been turned by the current government, which has been in power for two and a half years, as unaffordable. Defence Minister uh, Parikar has said it on numerous occasions. According to various media reports, in the month of October, Indian embassies in Moscow, Stockholm and Washington wrote letters to fighter jet manufacturers to confirm whether they would partner with an Indian company in building a medium single engine fighter with significant transfer of technology to the Indian entity. As you rightly mentioned, the contenders are the F-16 and the Gripen in the single engine category and possibly, possibly, uh, more number of profiles because even that has been speculated upon in the, uh, in the media in the last couple of days, which would also mean that we could be looking at uh, the F-18 which is offered by the media. It's very difficult to say which aircraft is the front runner, what will be the numbers and whether MOD uh, will uh, go in for some kind of a G2G agreement or it would resort to limited tendering. Um, Though in my opinion, of course, it makes eminent sense to go in for some kind of a G2G agreement. Uh, what is certain, however, at this stage is that A, uh, given the continuing uh, attrition in squadron strength of the Indian Air Force, the number is indeed going to be large. Uh, B, that um, the, the aircraft will have to be manufactured in India. C, maybe Indian government will also insist on the MRO being done in India as well as all the subsequent uh, upgrades. I think the question now is which is a better buy in terms of make in India, in terms of enhancing the value of local industry in our military uh, production, particularly in this aerospace sector, and thirdly, 
combining the two uh, what can be done in the immediate time is an important consideration the two competitors at this stage are the uh, uh, Saab uh, the Gripen Sweden Swedish Gripen and the US F16 model uh, there are pros and cons for both and uh, both have been uh, campaigning very hard to say that they would set up local production facilities in India. Uh, they would uh, do complete technology transfer. So all of this is very uh, sort of exciting for India that uh, finally something under the Make in India initiative, these are things that are coming in within, uh, within India. The manufacturers as far back as in 2007 or 2008 had agreed to transfer that entire uh, production line to India. Uh, I find it very unfathomable why we refused that offer, the offer at that point of time. Because connected with that offer was Gripen's uh, virtual commitment to build with Indian Air Force and the production industry. The next generation had. There is the connectivity between the HGFA which we have signed, the tentative design and preliminary design has been signed. But the detailed R&D design is nowhere. We have been waiting for five years. This is amazing fighter jet race where both Saab and Lockheed Martin have pitched in their single engine fourth generation fighter jets. While Ministry of Defense plays the referee, Indian Air Force will be the end user. Both Saab and Lockheed Martin are locked in aggressive maneuvers in support of their fighters. All right, Lockheed Martin is very pleased to be here at Aero India 2017, where we have brought uh, together with the U.S. Air Force not only the F-16 that's uh, come in from Misawa, but we have here, and uh, what I'd like to share with you is a little bit about the F-16 Block 70. And uh, Colonel Balzerak here is flying uh, this cockpit demonstrator, he's got several thousand hours in F-16s and uh, the Block 70 which is on offer here for India uh, is the most advanced F-16 that we've ever offered, ever designed, developed, manufactured at any point in time. It comes with the APG-83 active electronically scanned array radar. This fixed array radar is state of the art. It uses technologies that come from the F-35 AESA radar built by the same company Northrop Grumman and integrated by Lockheed Martin. Hi, I'm uh, Sudhir Varma and I'm sitting in the cockpit of the most modern fighter and the futuristic fighter Gripen E. And why I call it uh, the futuristic fighter is because you can see the cockpit. It is in fact the first aircraft which, is, which will have uh, the wide area display. As you see there is one single display here and it can either have five displays inside or I can touch and it's a touch screen and I can touch it and have the whole display like you see there is a single display of the tactical area, tactical map. Similarly, if I have my radar picture, uh, the synthetic aperture radar or the terrain picture, I can project it here while I do the normal uh, flight functions through my head-up display and I can have it here also. That's only just one. 70 point. has that radar, it has a new mission computer, it has a lot of additional space for growth for the future, it has new cockpit displays, it has a new data bus management system and uh, basically we've taken the F-16, the tried and true 9G unmatched aero performing F-16 and extended its um, capabilities and added those kinds of um, leading edge technologies to it to make it so that it's ready to fight the fight not just for today but for the future. It has software driven performance. We can, as you know, the software and the processing capability of computers is increasing at a geometrical progression, you know. Uh, so normally what happens, aircraft are designed in particular time frame, then they have a midlife upgrade after 15 years. 15 years is a long time in computational technology and uh, aircraft then lags behind the processing power. Here what we can do is, we can modify software on a daily basis if you want and customer can do it. So it will be Indian Air Force actually which will be empowered to do that as they want, change the functionalities of the sensors decision support systems and uh, 
actually, uh, as the threat changes in future, they can match the threat with the uh, new tactical functions. And what all of these technologies do is they bring added situational awareness into the cockpit. What, what we really have discovered through the F-22 and the F-35, and, and they're now integrating into our F-16 for India, is that it's inside the cockpit, and Colonel Balzerak would tell you, inside the cockpit, it's really all about situational awareness, and that APG-83 radar provides maximum situational awareness so that you're always working with a full plate of understanding what your adversary is doing. So uh, This is based out of our open architecture design in the software where we segregate the flight critical functions from tactical functions. And that's not the only thing. As we will see later, the uh, aircraft is designed for very easy integration of sensors, weapons and systems. That's why it is the first aircraft in the world to be equipped and be operational with Meteor Missile. The current version, that is CD, which you see on the flight display, that is uh, actually flying, that's operational with Swedish Air Force, with Meteor, which is uh, actually uh, made by MBDA. And that's only because it was easy, it was cheaper and faster to integrate on Gripen. Say that this is the Block 70, and while we don't compare country to country, this is the Block 70. It's the most advanced F-16 we've ever offered to any country. And um, uh, while it's true that 25 countries fly F-16 today, it's a remarkable success story. Pakistan's one of those countries. Um, uh, as you say, we're standing here with the, the Gripen aircraft. Um, and uh, some of the latest generation of weapon system that we have integrated on the, the aircraft where we are showing here today. Uh, what we see here is uh, BVO designs called the Meteor, Saab uh, design, um, air to surface, uh, field target, uh, missile 15. Uh, we also see a uh, reconnaissance pod, which is called the Recce Light. But basically, we have the latest generation of weapon systems and sensors we can are already integrated. This weapon here is an Irish T. IRS, the Irish T is a within visual range uh, missile. Uh, it's what we call a high off boresight missile, so the, the missile seeker can uh, see very far out, and, and also the, um, the, the missile is extremely agile, so you can actually fire it and kill uh, targets behind yourself. And you can, for instance, slave this missile to your helmet mounted display and you just look at the target and you fire. So, a very, very impressive uh, weapon. So, the kind of old fashioned way of doing dogfight, you don't do that, you go right, right in, you act up to the opponent, you look at him, you shoot and you, you're out of there. So, so, it's a very big different compared to the old way of when you had to actually maneuver in behind the target to be able to... This aircraft goes further. It stays longer, it carries more ordnance, it goes faster and it turns harder. And so it's a superior aero performer, updated, refreshed, and, and, and made much more capable for the future using fifth generation technologies that only Lockheed Martin has to, to bring to the fight that we've taken off of our F-35 and F-22. Uh, it's a 9G aircraft. Uh, I mean, there are many 9G aircraft, but uh, the agility of, of the uh, Gripen, it goes from 1G to 9G within one second and it can actually stay at this high uh, turn rate because it, it's, a lot, it's a very powerful aircraft so you can stay at those high G limits for and, and actually keep your speed and keep your maneuvers. And that is also a lot to do with the flight control system. Uh, the flight control system tries to minimize uh, the, the drag so it's a very sleek aircraft, uh, so you can keep those high turns and uh, right. 
It's a remarkable offer. We've offered uh, a Make in India uh, compliant story here, and uh, we have a, a great deal of success here in India working with your industry. We've done uh, F-16 production around the world in multiple places. We've done it in Korea, we, we have accomplished it in Turkey, we've accomplished it in Belgium and in the Netherlands. We are also doing it today on F-35 in Italy and in Japan and uh, we bring all of that technology, all of that capability as a company and our experience here in India and we offer it to the Indian people. We are using Whatever, whatever the customer wants, we can actually integrate. I generally don't talk about my competitor aircraft. Um, I, I would say it's not always true about my competitors talking about my aircraft, but um, I'll just say this, and it's really a decision, uh, if you look at, if you compare the two airplanes, a decision that, that your Air Force and your, and your government has to make for itself. And, and, but, but even though they're both single engine aircraft, they really do two different things. They're designed for two largely different purposes. One is predominantly a self-defense aircraft. It has uh, uh, a relatively smaller combat radius and fewer ordnance capability. It's, it's good at self-defense close in. But Lockheed Martin makes power projection aircraft, and that's what the F-16 is. So it, it, because it's a bigger aircraft, it carries more fuel, it goes further, and, and as I said before, it goes further, it can stay longer, it can carry more ordnance. And so, uh, both fine aircraft, the F-16 being the most successful aircraft in modern history, with 28 customers around the world and 4,588 aircraft. Uh, it won't be very good of me to talk negative about my competition, uh, but, but I think we all know F-16 is uh, uh, really uh, at the limit of its uh, capability in terms of updates. How much can you improve? The Block 70, they have done a lot of improvement, but I don't think they can go hereafter. We, on the other hand, we are pitching the most modern, latest fighter in the world today, Gripen E. It will first aircraft will fly this year and will be then delivered to Brazil and Sweden from 2019 onwards. So. This is the future of fighter aviation. This is where we will build, and this is built on latest, uh, like I told you, software-driven performance. Whatever happens in future, whatever uh, happens in threat perception, the battlefield, we will be quickly able to update this aircraft and keep it aligned with the threat scenario for next 40, 50 years. And that's why we say it is ready for 2050, actually. No, of course not. The United States Air Force is extending the life of their F-16s for 30 more years. I'm building new F-16s for customers today. I'll have another new F-16 customer early this year. I am still building F-16s. This aircraft will fly for 12, 13,000 hours into the future, and, and that's 40 to 50 more years. So the notion that, that this is uh, the, the, the aircraft that somebody wants to talk about that was built in 1970 is simply untrue. This aircraft has the very latest technologies, as I said earlier, drawn from, from Lockheed Martin, the only company that builds fifth generation airplanes, F-22 and F-35, and we've taken those technologies and poured them back into our F-16. It is a platform of future. We are ready to bring to India the entire technology we are ready to uh, transfer technology not only for manufacture, we are not only shifting an assembly line which my competition is also doing, we are shifting a capability here. It will be a capability for the Indians to design, to develop and adapt new weapons, new sensors and thereafter maybe after some time design a new aircraft after this. Fierce competition for fighter sale but Trump card lies with Trump administration whose policy line holds the future of not only F-16 but that of Gripen E2 as engine and ISA radar of Gripen E are manufactured by US companies. If F-16 is allegedly an old design then Gripen E is a multinational integration platform. There are things that are going against F-16 for instance because it's been around for several decades now and that 
it's coming to the end of life in a sense and I think that's one big factor that is going against the F-16 at this stage. But F-16, there have been several versions and the Block 70 that they have been offering to the US has been offering to India is uh, far superior with greater, with more sophisticated, with a great uh, sophisticated radar systems and so on and so forth. And it also the uh, pilot awareness, uh, domain awareness that is given to the, that that comes with for a pilot is far superior. So there are several advantages that I see, but more importantly, the advantage that I see with the F-16 is the strategic element that Defense uh, Minister Manohar Parikar has been talking about, saying that this will be based on the strategic partnership model that we want to continue into the future. If that is the case, I don't see such a huge merit in uh, I'm not, I'm, I'm not un underestimating the value of Sweden as an important partner, but if I were to compare between Sweden and the US, the strategic partnership value that I get from the US is far greater than, um, than Sweden. What's an F-16? F-16 is a 1970s aircraft. It's already how many, 50, nearly 50 years old aircraft you're buying. You're going to pay good money for it. Sure, they're going to upgrade it, but their basic plan form, as they call it, the plan form is the basic architecture of the plane, is still 1970s. Designed for that time. Designed to deal with threats, military or aircraft threats of that time. This is the modern age, where you have to be stealthy, you have to be small, you have to be agile, you have to be very maneuverable. In any case, manned aircraft are going out of the picture more and more. Unmanned war. Unmanned war, which I've been talking about. I first wrote about unmanned drones 40 years ago, or 35 years ago. And yet the, in, the Indian Air Force is thinking as if it's fighting the Second World War. The last combat aircraft buy that India will do, these 90 aircraft that we are talking about, as per my assessment, uh, of course, FGFA is already in the, uh, in the pipeline. But I think the question about the replacement of the light combat aircraft through its updatation in, in terms of the next generation fighter, where some work has been done on the drawing board by the Hindustan Aeronautics, that should be India's highest priority. I do believe that in that sense, uh, going the Gripen way would be a better proposition. You raise the question about Block 70 F-16, the Pakistani flight Block 52. Uh, we must not forget that even though the modular digital changes uh, was inside the aircraft far more critical than the airframe, but we need to understand that aerodynamically there are many design features of the F-16 which go to actually 1970. Uh, the Saab Gripen is 30 years uh, later. Three decades, there has been a revolution. Um, the US has been trying to make the case that F-16 production facility would serve as the local hub and it can export, for instance, spare parts to a whole lot of Middle Eastern as well as Southeast Asian partners from India. I personally would think, uh, not that it's uh, necessary for the debate, that uh, the, the selection of uh, the Gripen would be, a, would be a very sound one, only for the reason that not only will it keep the cost minimal, it will not only ensure, of course, subject to the Americans clearing the Gripen uh, sale uh, from the point of view of it being engined by an American engine, F-414, and the radar of that. Will the US, under, especially under the Trump administration, which has been saying that America first and so on and so forth, how does this play out? Uh, there, is an, uh, there is an answer to that, which is that this F-35 program is now going to be you know, revived and uh, revamped in a sense. And the production, so the production facility that might be closed for the F-16s would now, those employees will be taken into the F-35 facility. And therefore, F-16 moving into India, the production facility moving into India is not going to make a huge difference in the U.S. domestic employment you know, domain in a sense. If we have such a problem uh, confronting us by way of an American policy on denying India its genuine defense capability by acquiring the Gripen as against the F-16, then we also have uh, arrows in our quiver to be able to ensure that our needs are
No, I think in that sense, the geopolitical scenario today and in the decades ahead very much favors India. We are not talking about the 60s and the early 70s when India was vulnerable in the defense sector to pressures being put, out in, put on the country by way of the military equipment and its uh, product support in terms of spares. We have witnessed that when the Soviet Union imploded in December 1991. So I, I think geopolitically it's not a problem. The Who guarantees for components, spares and weapons in today's geopolitics that is dynamically in flux. In this amazing race of fighter jets, some experts say India will lag behind in unmanned warfare which is now in its fifth generation. Building on homegrown fighter program can make India win in long run. When the IF you know, makes up its list of requirements, uh, the question is all, that is, all all the aircraft it desires, do we have the money to pay for it? If you do not have the money, it doesn't matter what you want. You cannot afford it. Now, unfortunately, that's the situation right now. We do not have the monies. Uh, but the Air Force is stuck in importing aircraft. That's all it has done most of its life. Uh, so earlier, if you recall, there was something called HF Marut, HF-24, that was killed by the Air Force and the Ministry of Defense. It has never developed an indigenous design directorate, like the Navy has a warship directorate. It has no capability other than to write up qualitative requirements for aircraft that have absolutely have no connection with reality. They look up advertisement brochures of advanced aircraft and they make up the QRs. QRs are the specifications. No, I think it's very bad for India. It's not needed. It's not at all necessary. The reason being that we have our own single engine fighter which needs to be developed, which is the Tejas light combat aircraft, which has its own Tejas, then there's the 1A, then there's the Mark II, and then there's the Tejas derivative, the advanced medium combat aircraft. These are indigenous products designed at home to be produced here doesn't own up to your own homegrown products and programs like the Tejas. And that's the real problem. Tejas is a beautiful platform. It has great potential for growth. It's a very modern platform in terms of the aerodynamics, in terms of its uh, stealth capabilities. It's far more agile, can maneuver better than Rafale. It is far stealthier than any, any of the uh, Rafale F-16s or anybody else, incidentally. So it can sneak in against the enemy. Enemy cannot spot him in the skies. It's a very dangerous aircraft, but apparently these kinds of qualities do not impress the Indian Air Force. As far as warfare, it is not only one individual aircraft which is going to be the deciding factor. Number one is, as far as the feel on the aircraft is concerned, definitely Tejas, our pilots will be in a better position to fly because they are confident and they will be more familiar. Moreover, there will be an entire Indian industry which will be supporting this program. But an aircraft, apart from its own fighting capability, will also depend upon what is the overall integrated air defense mechanism of the country, which is a target country, what will be the support system by our other forces, so it will be very difficult to say that this platform will be superior or their platform will be superior. It will be in our interest to use Tejas because we are more familiar with this platform as on date. Semi knockdown kits and CKDs completely knock down kits. These are you know packages of the entire aircraft, they come in a package. We just put it together. You you sit down and look at the manual and screw it. That's all you have. You, the, you get no technology, you don't ingest anything, you don't innovate any technology, nothing. And these people are saying we're creating hubs and kya kya maale, you know, they're promising a lot. But the point is, you end up, for all the imports that you have, for everything you import, you're going to pay lots of money. That's they're very happy. When you say license manufacture, they're very happy with license manufacture deals because it means they make money in perpetuity. That's why I say it looks about 12, 15 billion dollars. When you finally end up, you'll end up paying 50 billion dollars and more. 
This is what happens with every program that we do with licensed manufacturers. Financial projections may not be the correct projections, that is one. Number two, I feel the way the defense budgets of different countries are shrinking. It's a time when manufacturing companies find it difficult to sustain operations in their parent country. So if today the correct techno-economic decisions are taken, I think the cost will be much, much less and it will not be that exorbitant. But other than that, most important thing will be that when we take this decision, we'll also have to see what kind of technologies we are getting. We are getting a complete mastery on the technologies and know-how. Then definitely whatever knowledge we get on these platforms, that can also help us in reducing the import content on our Tejas platform. So that way, there is an ample scope where synergies can be created. Neither the F-16 nor the Gripen E, as it's called the Gripen E, that's the model, is a long-range fighter. These are just medium range for Pakistan contingencies. And because in our head we have no threat except Pakistan, we are in that uh, state of mind where we don't see any threats other than Pakistan. And Pakistan itself is not a threat. Pakistan is nothing. What is this? It's not even a remotely credible military threat. It's a nuisance, not a threat. Great difference. We don't seem to make a distinction between. And all the companies are promising that, that they'll create what they call an ecosystem a global servicing and production hubs for these aircraft. But the question is, when the warfare itself is moving in the, is progressing and advancing beyond manned aircraft roles, what are we talking about? You know, I mean, are we, and by the way, when you buy these, when you say we want to buy and produce a single engine aircraft, it'll take another five to eight years, 10 years. Right? In the 10 years, we could have had most of our 1A, Mark IIs and AMCA, uh, light combat aircraft, Tejas, up in the air. We would have had the monies that we're investing, giving away to foreign suppliers. We have been invested in our own companies. So we could have done that by also, for instance, the best thing that we could do, we can do for the Tejas, is to transfer technology from DRDO and HUL and, and uh, the uh, National Aeronautics Laboratory and the ADA, the Aeronautical Development Agency, their technologies to a private sector. The private sector is invariably better than HEL and the DPSUs, the Defense Public Sector Units, who are inefficient, labor productivity is very low, they are screwdriver technology, they don't know very much of anything, but you have LNT, one of the greatest great companies of the world, they make nuclear submarines, but you want to buy screwdriver technology. You know, I just don't understand the government of India's attitude or thinking. I feel that government policies are quite enabling. Like as far as DRDO is concerned, once the product is developed, it is passed on to the industry. So they are fully enabling. As far as defense PSUs are concerned, in last two, three years, they have also increased their level of outsourcing like on the new platforms light like combat helicopter etc and also the basic trainer HL has taken a decision that they will be primarily an integrator and almost entire supply chain will be outsourced so i feel that government is quite enabling the psus and drdos have also understood that it's not a time that they will make everything from the drying pin, drying pin to the engine but are we ready to build fighters matching the capabilities of those like Gripen E and F-16, can Indian industry lead the revolution to build indigenous fighter jets, landing Indian Air Force the real combat power? Ultimately, Indian Air Force has to fight the war. Let's listen in what R. Kityagi, former chairman of Hindustan Aeronautics Limited, is to say. That means we are talking of replacement of something like 16 squadrons. 16 squadrons means about 320 aircrafts. Now, Tejas, manufactured by HL, is our own homegrown product, an excellent product, and our defense forces are also very confident of it. But right now, the manufacturing capability of HL is eight aircrafts per year. They have certain difficulties, and last two years, they have been able to produce only four aircrafts per year. 
even if they work at the fullest efficiency, 8 aircrafts per year, that means to replace 320 aircrafts, it is going to take 40 years. So will the defense forces or government wait for that long? The answer is no. So there will be three options. Number one, we augment the production capacity of HL. I understand that recently government has agreed to a proposal where additional 1300 crore will be given to HL and the production capacity will be augmented to 16 aircraft per year. If that happens, it will take 20 years. So, is 20 years acceptable to Indian Air Force? Possibly the answer will be no. That means further augmentation will be needed. The second option will be that HL will keep on producing, but we create a joint venture where HL and the private industry is a partner and we tell this joint venture that you produce another 16 aircrafts per year. That way we produce 32 aircrafts per year. So we, in 10 years we meet the need of defense forces. Plus also we always had an ambition of export of our aircrafts, especially in this fighter category. That ambition can also be met. If these two things can happen, that will be the best scenario for the country. But if option 1 and 2 is not happening, if HL continues producing at the rate of 8 aircrafts per year or does not go beyond 16 aircrafts per year, then we have to go for third option. That is under Make in India program, invite foreign OEMs, ask them to establish factories in the country, ask them to give us the know why and know how and then go on the production line. But this decision will not be only an economic decision, it will be a strategic decision like country will decide with which country they will like to go. Then Air Force will decide what kind of technologies will be coming. And then of course cost will be an important factor, which product will be available to us at the attractive terms. So that will be a strategic, technical as well as a commercial decision. I think in the future technology transfers. What we should emphasize is the technology of manufacturing of engines of aircrafts. Because today the biggest handicap for the Indian aircraft industry is that whatever flies in Indian skies, whether it is military or whether it is civil flights, all the engines are made in the foreign countries. And if India tomorrow is aiming to become a superpower in the world, I think it is the engine technology which we should also master. So it is a time that in future technology transfers we must in, insist that the technologies for manufacture of the engine will also be made available to the country. That should be the case. According to sources, the companies have submitted their project proposals and plans to the government of India. But there is no official movement as yet after the embassies wrote to defense manufacturers in October in respective countries. Hydrat Combat Aircraft. We have uh, enough and we are going to add in this year to come. We will have the 42 squadrons of the Hydrat Combat Aircraft. By when, sir? By one. I will buy three in the four years. We have already signed with Prime Minister and the Camera. The CCS led by Prime Minister will take the final call, but it is but obvious that whatever decision the government will take would subserve the best interest of India.